two things. One, when you take a stage at an amazing event like this, you always hope the speaker before you is going to be kind of sleepy, a little confused, <laughs> maybe wander a bit, tell some personal anecdotes that don't make any sense. Uh, secondly, a uh, small correction, I'm uh, the Director of Technology Innovation for the district, so I'm focusing on a number of things, but most remain here. One, open data and open government, and two, inclusion. So really focusing on how we can tie those two things together meaningfully in the district uh, to power social change, to power smarter government, and all of the other great benefits that open data supposedly brings. So um, I wanted to take the stage here to set some definitions. I'm assuming uh, there are those amongst you who don't have a firm understanding of what open data is. And so I want to put everybody on even footing because we know that uh, jargon is a rhetoric of exclusion. And this event is all about including everyone and bringing our perspectives together. Um, and then I want to kind of trouble the definition and talk about ways that it's actually a bad fit for social justice and for civil rights um, in order to queue up our conversation this afternoon. So the best definition I think out there is for open data can be found on opendefinition.org and I'll just read it for you real quick. There's actually a longer form version, I'll read you the short one. Open means anyone can freely access, use, modify and share for any purpose um, subject at most to requirements that pre preserve provenance and openness. What does this mean? Three basic bullet points. One, open format means you're releasing your data in a convenient, modifiable form. Often we use the words machine readable to talk about this. So it means if you're releasing, um, uh, well, uh, DC's budget, I'll pick on DC, we release it in the form of about 15 giant PDFs. Um, having to download those and wade through those as opposed to being able to download an Excel document that you can make a pie chart against immediately, that's the difference between a, uh, an open format and a closed format. Access, you're making the data available at low or no cost via the internet. Um, those of you who have FOIA'd uh, any government anywhere for any record set will recognize that it off the experience of FOIAing doesn't match that definition. So if you're saying, look, people have FOIA'd for our um, uh, court dockets in the past and they got it and they weren't even charged that much. That's great, that's not open access. Open access is about proactively putting that information out there and ideally inviting people and engaging with the public to actually access it and use it. Um, and then the third point is that it should be made available under an open license, which means effectively, it's a complicated and nuanced discussion, but effectively it means you're putting it in the public domain and you're not um, putting any significant restrictions on how people can reuse it and redistribute it and um, work with your information. So a uh, classic example of this that comes up in two out of three open data talks is the National Weather Service. So the National Weather Service is something that probably everybody here uses on those surveillance technologies you all have in your pocket we talked about earlier. Uh, founded 1870, so one point here, open data is not a new idea. Uh, it powers weather.com, my favorite, uh, wonderground.com. It, po it powers every local news broadcast. Um, and what it does is it, it creates a shared context for truth. Every one of us has that one relative who thinks it's always colder than it is and that one relative who thinks it's always too hot, right? So if you have the National Weather Service providing this good canonical data that we can all agree is roughly true, those two people can talk about their, their experiences and what exact temperature the thermostat should be uh, in relation to that, that shared bedrock, even if they still draw different conclusions. Um, a quick way of illustrating this, I'm from Seattle, I've lived in DC for about 10 years. Uh, everywhere I go, small talk, when people ask me, uh, wow, it rains in Seattle a lot, right? Uh, it turns out, according to National Weather Service data, uh, Seattle gets about 36 inches of annual rainfall, whereas Washington DC gets about 40 inches of annual rainfall. Seattle's something like number 44 in the nation for major metropolitan areas in terms of rainfall, right? Now there's other data there. Um, this is a point where uh, data can create a, a false sense of truth. Uh, Seattle gets more days of rainfall, more continuous days of rainfall, even if there's not very much volume. So National Weather Service, that's awesome. We all use it, we all love it. Uh, there's a lot of ways that that doesn't look like uh, the sort of data that we need to support civil rights. Uh, one, weather's not people, right? Uh, as soon as sociology enters into it, there are a lot of questions, there's a lot of, uh, you know, our evolving concepts of justice, our evolving sense of what's appropriate in terms of data collection itself. Um, two, uh, if you're talking about temperature, you're talking about rainfall, there's sort of known vectors that we care about uh, historically about our weather. Uh, that's not always true about the sociology of the way our cities function, the way that our interactions between uh, residents and, and police officers and government work. There are emergent questions that we uh, didn't realize 10 years ago that we want to study now. 
uh, and nowhere is that more evident than if we talk about uh, the question between, um, uh, between transparency and surveillance with body cams. So um, right before I joined DC government, I was working for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Is anybody here familiar with that? So it's the, awesome. So it's the newest um, federal agency. It's been around for about five years. It focuses on trying to create a uh, more intuitive, more fair financial marketplace for consumers. So there's a real focus on sort of the end user of the system in an analogous way to way how we talk about civil rights often. We, we worry about what does it look like through the resident's eyes. Um, there's this amazing thing that they do. They have a complaint process. It looks like uh, if you're going to complain about an unsafe crib or if you're going to complain to the Better Business Bureau, you can go to CFPB and you can complain about your experience of, say, a charge landing on your credit card or your experience of being foreclosed on. What's amazing about this, two things. One, uh, in addition to all the other internal things that CFPB does with this data in terms of enforcement actions and driving legislation, regulatory changes, um, oh, I have one minute. Uh, it's also published as an open data offering. So you can go on CFPB's website, you can download all this data, and you can actually use it yourself to understand what's happening in the marketplace and power your, your discourse in your day-to-day -day life with your family, with your community, with your senator. We don't have one of those here. Um, <laughs> but also, what's really, really powerful about this, and this is the point that I want everybody to take back with them, is that you don't have to be, have been subject to a legal violation in order to complain to CFPB about what happened. What your experience, if you, let's say, are being foreclosed on and you just feel confused about it, you feel upset, you don't understand what's happening in your life, that expression of dissatisfaction or confusion, that's actually what CFPB is listening for and also what it's publishing back out. So this is a place where data collection and publication of data is being used to directly power what the future of justice, what the future of equity should look like, as opposed to what today's, um, what today's situation is or um, being used just to shut down uh, overt legal violations. Uh, so just to, I'm getting the stop sign, so just to close up, um, I think the, the, the final, final point here is, you know, we see this cadence of, of uh, journalism, open data coming out in relation to some of the civil rights issues of our day, and there's this amazing bifurcation in how people react to it. If you're a member of the affected community, think about stop and frisk, the, the reports hit the Wall Street Journal, and you're like, yeah, that's what we've been telling you. There's a, there are overt, huge inequities here. Why couldn't we get action on this before it hit the Wall Street Journal? And if you're a member of white middle-class America, often you go, my God, look at these numbers. So my invitation to the room is to dive into that difference, that phenomenology of the, the way that disparities are coming at us in relation to data and find ways to increase our shared experience of open data and civil rights issues to create change. Thank you. Thank you.